In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, you know how much can Mateus and I and the entire community here in the Priory and the sisters all miss you and long to see you again soon. He was particularly touching but also very difficult for us to have the May crowning without you. Our Lady is still outside with her crown for you to go and pray before at any time you like. On this Sunday, therefore, we'd like to speak to you a bit about the importance of this ceremony to remind you especially how dear it was to our holy patron, St. Francis de Sales. In the instruction of the beatification of St. Francis de Sales, one of the witnesses was a female religious who knew him in the first monastery of the visitation in Annecy. She referred that on one occasion a young man who had been possessed by the devil for the last five years was brought before the Bishop of Geneva, at that time Monsieur Charles Auguste de Salle, St. Francis's nephew and successor in the bishop's seat, brought before him to be exorcised. The interrogations of the devil were carried out next to the mortal remains of St. Francis. During one of these sessions, the devil cried out, full of fury, why should I have to leave? When the sister heard this, she invoked the Blessed Virgin, Most Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Mary, pray for us. When the devil heard these words, he cried out even louder, Mary, Mary, there is no Mary for me. Don't pronounce that name, which makes me shudder. If there were a Mary for me, as there is for you, I would not be what I am, but there is no Mary for me. Shaken by this scene, some of the people present began to cry. The devil continued, If I had just one instant of the many that you people lose, one lone instant and one Mary, and I would not be a devil. No saint did more than our dear St. Francis de Sales to teach us that we should not waste one moment given to us during this holy month of May. For he did more than any saint to popularize the devotions of the month of May, the rosary, processions, and daily meditations. Here at St. Mary's, what is especially dear to us is our May crowning, and we can only think of the beautiful words of the psalmist so often applied in the liturgy to the Holy Mother of God. With thy comeliness and thy beauty, set forth, proceed prosperously, and reign. Mary is the Mother of God. She is full of grace and the mediatress of all graces. And she is our queen. This declaration of her queenship comes as no surprise to any of you. Mary is the mother of our king. She is the queen mother of the son of David, prefigured in the Old Testament. She surpasses all the other saints in her fullness of grace and the power of her intercession. Surely this is enough to merit for her the title of queen, which tradition has always applied to her. But so far we have spoken of no more than a metaphorical queenship, a queenship of honor and preeminence. The lion is called the king of the jungle, but he exercises no real authority over the other animals. What shall we say of our blessed lady? Is she our queen in the proper sense? 
does she exercise sovereign rights over us? I answer that question with a resounding yes. And I invite you to meditate for a moment on the beautiful explanation. When Pope Pius XI instituted the Feast of Christ the King, he declared on that day that all Christians should kneel before the Blessed Sacrament, exposed, and pronounce the consecration of the human race to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This consecration to the Sacred Heart underlines the meaning of the Feast of Christ the King. By the devotion to the Sacred Heart, we honor the mystery of a God who became man in order to love as man loves and suffer as man suffers. God alone can be said to be king over the created world without any qualification. And Jesus Christ is true God, therefore he is true king. But what our feast teaches us is that Jesus Christ, even as a man, merits the title of king. And this is true for three reasons. First of all, the man, Christ Jesus, is substantially united to a divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, such that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, human and divine. That man is a person who must be acknowledged by the entire universe as king. Secondly, the man, Christ Jesus, is full of grace. As God, his grace is infinite. He is grace itself. And as man, he is the source of all graces bestowed on the poor children of Eve, such that no man may ever see the face of God except through him. Finally, the man, Christ Jesus, has a kingship which he earned by his victory over death on the cross as St. Paul proclaims, for which cause God hath exalted him and hath given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Blessed Virgin Mary takes part in this threefold royalty of the humanity of Jesus Christ, in a manner more exalted than that of all the other saints, even though all saints are said to reign with Christ. Mary gave her human nature to the second person of the Trinity, and the king of the universe deigned to be governed by her during his life on earth. How can any other man dare to challenge her authority? She is full of grace from the first moment of her conception, and Christ has never given and will never give any of the graces of his redemption except through her. The victory of Christ on Calvary was her victory as well. When our Lord was scourged, she felt every blow. When he was nailed to the cross, she looked upon her son and made his pain her own. But when the soldier pierced our Lord's side with a lance, he was already dead. The pain of that blow was reserved for Mary alone, as Simeon had predicted, thy soul too a sword shall pierce. Our victorious Lord did not leave his sacred humanity behind when he returned to heaven, and it was his will that his mother should reign with him, body and soul, in heaven. All the other saints reign with him by adoption. Mary reigns with him by right of blood. If, then, Mary is our queen in the proper sense, if she participates really and even physically in the kingship of her son, it follows that we are her subjects, and that she exercises rights over us. 
St. Francis de Sales, speaking especially of the privilege of the Immaculate Conception, wrote, The Son of Eternal Love thus clothed his mother in gilded clothing surrounded with variety, that she might be the queen of his right hand. The Blessed Virgin Mary could not have been at any moment for existence an enemy of God. She was to give God her own human nature, and she was to bear God and to rule with God. This is indeed a new kind of Queen Mother. She is not merely the mother of a boy who became king. She is the mother of one who is king from all eternity and who willed that his kingdom should come on earth as it is in heaven, through her. What better patroness for our nation, which recognizes no king, but is so desperately in need of a queen, who has no part in sin and is so powerful in protecting her subjects from the relentless attacks of the forces of hell? Let us not then waste a single moment of this beautiful month of May, Let us imitate the example of our holy patron and make a holy month of Mary. Stay faithful to your rosary every day, to the rosary in the family whenever you can. How especially important this practice is right now, as you still cannot come to Holy Mass. Do not be afraid to ask the Blessed Virgin today for great grace this month, the grace to conquer a persistent vice or the conversion of family members. I promise you this mother of mercy will not fail you. The darkness of these times invites us to hope that we may well live to see the triumph of Mary's immaculate heart which she promised to the shepherd children at Fatima. By thy pure and immaculate conception, O Mary, obtain for us the conversion of Russia Europe, our own nation, and the whole world. Amen. Don't forget to click subscribe and click the bell to be notified of future videos.